Hi, this is Billy J. Kramer, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Maranucci. Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles show that we call things we said today. This is a weekly program that focuses on what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by Steve Marinucci of Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, Hey, everybody. How you doing? On today's show, we're going to be reviewing one of the most anticipated, highly anticipated Beatle books in a long time. And that being Mark Lewison's brand new book called All These Years. That's the name of his Beatles biography. And the first volume just came out called Tune In. I think you'd have to say it's probably the the absolute most anticipated. I don't think there's any book that even compares with this as far as anticipating. I mean, when he announced this thing, a couple of years ago, people were already going, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. And as time got closer, the comments online, on Facebook and everything, have been just incredible. And now that it's out, you know, everybody's everybody's all excited, you know, and we'll talk about that. But, yeah, I mean, the anticipation has just been amazing. Yeah, and uh, we have both finished reading the book. And what we're going to do is talk about what we feel were the most interesting bits of information that we learned coming from this book on Beatle history. And I also have a clip to play because I privately interviewed Mark about a week ago or so on uh, November the 5th, to be exact. And um, it was just another wonderful time that I spent with him. We did about uh, an hour. The interview lasted about an hour. We talked about a variety of subjects. The one the one thing about interviewing him, especially as you learn so much in the book, there's no way you can cover everything that you want to. So um, I thought that Steve and I would talk about uh, what we found the most interesting things that we learned from this book, or maybe certain things that are new to us in telling the Beatles story, maybe certain myths that have been broken through the years. But um, do you think, uh, Steve, we should just go right into this Mark Lewis and Clip, or do you want to bring up one yourself? Let's, let's start talking about some of the things in the book first. Okay. And I'll start, and I'm not going to hit with the big stuff first, but the one of the things that caught me was the, the old story about, um, you know, I don't like your tie. And, and Mark says that George Martin didn't really appreciate that comment, which was really kind of funny because, you know, all along we've always got the impression that George was, you know, took it, you know, took it as a joke and was was really kind of didn't have any problem with the comment, but apparently, according to Mark, he did. Hmm. And I thought that was uh, that's on page for those of you looking, having your book in front of you. It's on page six forty four, and it's like I was very surprised at that. At the but same then time, again, knowing George as the you know, know George being the guy the very proper British guy and, and the Beatles being these young upstarts, maybe that's not so hard to believe after all. Mm. But also, during that first recording session, June 6th of 1962, the Beatles really didn't say all that much during that session. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they let the engineers do the talk, and in fact, George Martin wasn't there in the very beginning. They had Ron Richards, the engineer there, and Norman Smith. And the Beatles kind of let them, you know, control the whole situation. So there wasn't that much conversation going on between the Beatles and George Martin and and the engineers. And Do you so really when, think that they had any leverage at that point? I mean, they really didn't. They were really in a position where they were the new guys on new kids on the block, right? And they really, it's it, it's really kind of, you know, I'm not sure that they would have had a whole lot of. Uh, authority. I mean, they were basically under orders to do what they were told. And that's one of the things about some of the stuff that's in the book. You read the way things went, you know, that Mark, you know, the details in some of these instances, and you go, 
you know, maybe that doesn't, and maybe that makes sense. I mean, you know, it, it maybe that's not so surprising, you know, and and that's one of those things where it's not really surprising to me that they didn't say a whole lot. Um, no, it's not surprising to me, but the point that I wanted to bring up was that when George Harrison made that comment, the I don't like your tie comment, that was a real icebreaker there. Mm-hmm. And so, as George Martin has told the story countless times, during that session, he wasn't that impressed with their music. Love Me Do was the best they could come up with. Mm -hmm. And so when George Harrison said that, you know, he he liked their charm. He liked their personality. He liked their charisma. He thought we can we can really have something here. But he wasn't too impressed with with the material that they played. Right. So the fact that George Harrison said what he did, which was, you know, it took a lot of guts for him to make a little comment like that, uh, really helped the situation. Right. There are so many. There's so many. In, you know, there's so many things in the book that you kind of that you look at and you just kind of go, "Wow!" I mean, you know, the de- the detail in the book is just you know what's really astonishing, and the 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 underlying information that we've never had before is you know of course one of the big selling point of the book. But it's amazing. It's like a curtain has opened, you know, and and all these things that we've never known are there now. Well, the thing is, there's so many interesting tidbits here in this book where you're dealing with circumstances where certain things changed in the lives of of the Beatles. And if it, if it had gone in a different course, things could have turned out completely different. Right. And you could say that probably about any major success story, but there's so many twists and turns in the Beatles story here. And that was one of the things, um, that was a question that I asked Mark in San Francisco when I hosted the the book signing session, I said there really was a lot of luck involved in their success story as opposed to the we're going to the top, you know, kind of thing, the top or most comment that, that everybody knows about. And he agreed. He said there was there was quite a lot of luck involved with the Beale story and things could have turned out different in in you know, in several ways because of several factors, but they didn't, obviously, but yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty. It's pretty interesting that when you think about that, that in addition to their career path, and in addition to you know Brian Epstein putting them, you know, uh, doing all the things he did, there was a lot of luck involved too. So oh, th- there's so much luck in the Beatles story. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, this whole book. It sheds so much light in that area. Right, and. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, I can think of several instances where, I, you know, there are certain things that I wasn't aware of where the story of the Beatles could have changed mm-hmm. entirely. I mean, just uh, I know um, Ringo was playing for Tony Sheridan at right. the Top Ten Club in Hamburg. And at the end of that period, when, when he was finished, Ringo's grandmother died. And he had to go back to Liverpool to go to the funeral. And just at that time... Uh, Tony's contract extension, or they wanted to extend him for another two periods there. Mm -hmm. And Tony wanted to keep Ringo. And he would have asked Ringo to stay with him had he not left Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And who's to say, you know, if he had stayed in Hamburg all that time, if the Beatles would have contacted him? I mean, Mm -hmm. they they did very much really appreciate Ringo's drumming. And they loved his playing. And they got along with him great. And... After a while, it became apparent that he was the drummer of choice to John, Paul, and George. And so it's very, it, likely, it's very likely they would have called him even if he stayed in Hamburg, but things could have changed. It could have changed differently. Yeah, and we're kind of, we're, we're kind of getting into the, the, the whole Pete Best story, which is, another, which is one of the big you know, selling points or one of the big revelations in Mark's book. Mm. And the, the detail, that's another one of those things that makes so much sense the way Mark lays it out. Right. It's amazing that, you know, another author had not come across with that detail or hadn't figured that out. Everybody, you know, everybody has always gone with the, he looked like James Dean guy, kind of guy, and, you know, he, he, they, he was the, they knew he was the loner type, but they didn't, nobody ever really made a point that it figured in that much to the, into the reason why they dropped him. 
Yeah. There is a there is a comment by one fan in there, in in Mark's book that pinpoints it, that nails it exactly. That it's really kind of funny when you read it, that the fan caught it, but nobody else did. Hmm. And that's pretty astonishing. Well, you pretty know, through the years, all the theories as to why Pete was fired that we've all heard many times, many times over. Mm-hmm. That uh, Paul was jealous of Pete. That uh, Pete got more girls. He was better looking. And that's all. And the, and and you're right. And that's all recounted in, recounted in the book. And and it's and in fact, you know, and Pete himself, if you if you, when you interview Pete, he's always said he doesn't he doesn't know. Right. And that was that was another question I asked Mark. I said, why did Pete always tell people he didn't know? And Mark said he knew. He knew. He just kept it to himself. Well, the thing is, in this book, from the very onset, you get the feeling that Pete was the odd man out. Mm -hmm. He was very much, he kept to himself, and uh, he really wasn't with the Beatles all that much, except when they were performing on stage. He didn't really hang out with them. No. After they were through with, with with their shows at night, playing in Hamburg, he didn't stay with them all that much. Right. He did sleep in the same quarters with them, but at the same time, he wasn't really one of the guys. Right. And his drumming didn't really improve all that much. And even uh, there's a comment in there that he would speed up and slow down quite often. And even, and this I found really interesting, when there were those important moments when the Beatles were in, when they were recording for Bert Camfort, for example, Bert didn't like his drumming. And Bert didn't want him to play the bass drum on those, those sessions with Tony Sheridan. And when the Beatles had their deck audition, the engineer didn't like Pete as a drummer. He even said in the book, you can find a better drummer anywhere in Liverpool. If you listen to those Polydor recordings, I mean, you, know, you see that. And, you know, you see it in, in the deck auditions. You can, you can tell it. You know, there's a, the, the difference in style between Ringo and, and Pete is, is not hard to hear. It's real, it's real difficult sometimes for me, not so much to accept this, but I've, I've been privileged to talk to Pete several times, and he's been so nice. He's yeah, a really I, nice I guy. Yeah, I have I, I met him, uh, I've, I've interviewed him on a couple of occasions. I met him in person uh, once. Yeah, and he certainly gives me the impression that he was one of the guys, mm-hmm. you know, and he was pretty much a loner. He kept to himself. He didn't say all that much to the audience. He didn't have the personality that the others did. The other three would clown around a lot. They had a certain sense of humor, and Pete didn't fit right in. He was basically there because they needed a drummer, and he stayed with them mainly due to the fact that they were trying to improve. They were trying to get as many gigs as they could, and also his mother was getting a lot of the the gigs for the group. Right. The, 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 The point you made about needing a drummer is very, very crucial here because... They picked him up just before they went to Hamburg. I mean, he he was a, a I don't want to know if you want to use the word desperation, but it was pretty close to that. Mm. You know, I mean, they needed a drummer. They had, there's that famous letter that that, that came out uh, I don't know about a year ago that where they were they were searching for a drummer and and um, and he was the guy. He was the man they chose. Mm-hmm. But when it came down to it. You know, they knew, they knew that they liked Ringo, and that was, you know, that was interesting. It was very, you know, that was very interesting, that, the way that happened. Yeah, well, when they had the June 6th recording session in 62, and George Martin said that he didn't like the drummer, that was pretty much it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, this is do or die now. They finally had a record contract, which is another thing to bring up, because that was, to me, the biggest bombshell of them all. In this book, the fact that the Beatles really had a record contract that was signed in May of 62 before they did that session, which was always called an audition, which it never really was. Right. In George Martin's mind and in his memory, he thinks of it as such because it was the first time that he was introduced to them. It's the first time that he saw them. But um, should we play the clip? Um, Go ahead. Let's go ahead and play it. But anyway, what, I, what I'm talking about here is that, um, to me, the most interesting 
to me, the, the greatest revelation in this book is the fact that the Beatles had a record contract all along. And how they actually achieved getting a record contract is different from the way we've been told all these years. There's so much more to the story than that. And it's not so much that what we've been told is completely inaccurate, because there is some accuracy to it, but there's a lot of holes there. And it's really fascinating when you listen to Mark tell the story after he did all this research, how this really happened. So I'm going to play a clip from my interview from uh, November the 5th. I'm going, to, I'm going to disagree with you real quick before you do that about the about the the big revelation in the book. I think the peep death thing is the big revelation. Why is that a re the biggest revelation? Because everybody, uh, although everybody has always figured that it was Pete's, that Pete was not a good drummer. The fact that Ringo fit in better, it, it's it's not that Pete was not uh, was a substandard was compared to Ringo was not as good. That it wasn't, wasn't just that. It was the whole he didn't fit in the way Ringo did. He oh, I think one I, of the guys. I think that it had more to do. It's both. There's no doubt about it. But I think it had more to do with the drumming. I, I really, I, I really think, do. I, I think the one of the guys thing was equally, if not more, the re the reason. I do because they just they didn't get along with him. They didn't get along with him, and and I think that was one. And they knew Ringo was was. You know, a, a folksier kind of guy in the in the uh, in the early six and uh, in, you know in '64 when they came to America that Ringo was the you know was a you know very easygoing guy. He was uh, very personable, very likable. You could see it in the Hard Day's Night the way you know he was so much a part of that movie. And and although that was an acting job, I mean, it was kind of a putting out there a you know a, a personality. I mean they. They wanted to keep that image going. I mean, he he was really he was really one of the guys, and mm -hmm. he was not. And I think that had a ton to do with it. I really do. I think you're right about that. But I do think that ultimately they were looking to improve as a band too, and in their mind, Pete was holding them back. And if you're going to the Bert Camford session and the Deck Audition session, and the people there are making comments about Pete's drumming. You know, it's um, they always struggled to have a drummer. That was that was their biggest struggle for a long time. They were right. a band without a drummer until Pete came along. Mm -hmm. So he was there because they needed him, and he fit the bill for that time. And it doesn't mean that he was a bad drummer, but they needed to improve as a group. And when they they saw what Ringo was capable of doing, and they liked his drumming, and they knew that he had all this other success, and they looked up to Ringo. Yeah. He had success in the Eddie Clayton Skiffle group, and from there to, to Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. He was actually making a living by himself as a musician. Right. They looked up to him for that reason. Right. And um, there's even a comment there in the book, one of the last shows in 1961 when Ringo filled in for Pete. I think Pete called in sick. And it was the first time when it was the four of them and just the four of them on stage. And they all said, you know, this feels right. It was the right fit. They liked his drumming. They, he added so much more with Ringo's style of drumming. And yes, the personality meant a lot, too. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of reasons why the Beatles exploded when they did. And people grew to love them. And it had more to do than just the music. The personalities were extremely important. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that initially. Well, they were sold on the. I mean, the personalities were a big selling point. That's what capital pushed in America. And I mean, from the it, it started at the the airport, that airport press conference. It, you know, it, it, there was all that all that stuff on stage the night they were on with Ed Sullivan with the with the subtitles going on. Uh, you know, there were just so many so many things. And yeah, I mean, it's really true. And and that's making me think here. Can you imagine what it would have been like Pete being there instead of Ringo? It would not have been as impressive. I can't imagine the Beatles films, for example, without Ringo in them. Right. <laughs> Having anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, but what can I say? The, the tough thing about this is, is that there are still people to this day who will defend Pete. Well, it, it, very much in, in, in Liverpool, there's, a, there's still a big 
he still has a lot of supporters. Of course, he's, that's where he's from. But yeah, there's there were a lot of people in the UK that still that still defend him. Hmm. Anyway, going back to the other story here about how the Beatles got their record contract with EMI, there's a lot more to the story than we've been led to believe all these years. So I think what we should do is listen to Mark himself tell this story. And uh, I just find this whole thing fascinating. So here goes. We're going to start by doing something which is different for me because I like to do everything chronologically. But considering the fact that this is, to me, the biggest bombshell in the book, I thought I'd try to get as much as I can of you talking about it, which is how the Beatles got their record contract with EMI. Right. Now, the way that I read it, it really uh, was the result of the fact that the publishing arm of EMI, Ardmore and Beachwood, was interested in the song Like Dreamers Do, and they wanted the publishing rights for that. But how could that turn into a recording contract with the group? Ah, uh, yes. Um, this all goes back a very long way for me because uh, when I wrote the recording sessions book in 87, 88, the, the thinking then was that the the, uh, the Beatles' first visit to Abbey Road on the 6th of June, 62, was an audition, and it's been described as an audition forever, everywhere. Uh, but in 1991, three years after their book was published, I should say that at Abbey Road, the paperwork for the very first session was quite thin, very thin, in fact, just the tape log. So I had nothing more to go on on that session. There was even a, a certain uncertainty about which studio it was in. When, three years after the book, I gained access to another archive within EMI, I found all the paperwork that related to the issuing of their recording contract. Uh, and the first thing that leapt out at me was the fact that they had been given this contract before their first session. And their first session was not an audition, but it was actually a session under a contract. Uh, and at that time I was working with George Martin a lot on different things, one of which was the making of Sgt. Pepper TV documentary. Mm -hmm. And we were spending a fair bit of time together. And one day I took photocopies of all these documents from the EMI archive in to show George and spread them all out in front of him. And I said, can you explain this to me? Because you appear to have signed them before you ever saw them. And he looked at them and he appeared genuinely bewildered uh, as to what these documents were trying to tell him. And he said, well, why would I have done that? Uh, why, why would I have signed them? And I was going, I don't know, George, you tell me. And we left the room that day without an answer. And I tried to come to, I tried to work, work my way into an answer for the Chronicle that came out that year, 1992. But it, it, it still didn't satisfy me. I, I still felt there was more to this story than met the eye. And um, the key was turned for me on this project for Tune In when I uh, finally found, after years of looking uh, for him, a man called Kim Bennett. Actually, that wasn't his real name. That was his professional name when he had been a singer. Um, you can find Kim Bennett records on eBay from time to time. Hmm. Um, late 1950s on Decca. He was working as professional manager or plugger, song plugger, at Ardmore and Beechwood, as you say. And he heard Like Dreamers Do from the Beatles' Decca test and liked it and wanted to publish it. But... Brian Epstein made it clear to Ardmore and Beechwood that though their interest in the songs was pleasing, what he really wanted was a recording contract for this group. These songs would be recorded by them before anybody else. And at that time, he was finding it very difficult to get them a recording contract. So Kim Bennett came up with a, an idea, which was fairly unusual, which was that EMI should let them make the recording, if you like, and is issue it on, on one of the EMI labels, but, Par but Ardmore and Beachwood would get the publishing on this song by getting it recorded, essentially. Mm -hmm. But this was not the way that things were usually done. So when they asked in Manchester Square, the headquarters of EMI, if it was would be allowed, the answer came back no. And that appeared to be the end of that. Brian Epstein did meet George Martin amongst all the other A&R men, and George was not impressed with what he had heard of the Beatles. He heard, I think, Hello Little Girl and Till, Till There Was, was you. you. And I've seen that record now. 
that's hmm. 78 with Brian's handwriting on it, pressed in the HMV shop. There is a copy in existence. Wow. And nothing more developed. Brian went back to Liverpool. Everybody had turned the Beatles down. They really pretty much had nowhere else to go. And then suddenly, in May 1962, Brian got a phone call from George Martin or from EMI saying, come down. And he went, he must have had some sense of what it was going to be about because there's a letter from Brian written that week that suggests he could return from London with some good news. And he went down and met George Martin and George Martin offered him a contract. So why is the question, which that's the backstory to right. your question. And the answer is that through a combination of events, um, coincidence and otherwise, um, George Martin's arm was twisted into signing the Beatles. It was no skin off his nose. I mean, it was, wasn't his personal money that would, would be spent. It was the company money. Um, but Len Wood, who was the managing director of EMI, was ultimately sympathetic to Ardmore and Beechwood's request that, that a record be made. Um, and he chose George Martin for this because of a number of events in the, which I outline in the book. I don't know how much you wanted me to give them away, but it was personal and business. Um, and it owed to a fairly fractious relationship that George had with Len Wood, a contract renewal negotiation that had not been entirely happy for either side, although it had been signed. George almost didn't re-sign with EMI. George was not exactly staff. He was staff at EMI, but they were on three-year contracts. So it wasn't just a permanent job forever. You would renegotiate the contract every three years. But and he was top man at Parlophone. He was, but all the A&R men were on the same kind of contract. They hmm. were the, the, the guys who ran Columbia and HMV, they were all on contracts like that as well. Uh, and it also owed to, well ultimately it owed to love because George Martin was married with two children um, but the marriage hadn't worked and he had moved out. His wife wouldn't grant him a divorce and very, very discreetly, with the utmost of discretion, he and Judy Lockhart Smith were now going out. No one knew this, this was a, a real secret because these were different times. This was not 2013, this was 1960, well, from 56 onwards, I think, to through to 60, well, through to 62, and then through to 66 when they got married. They're still together. Mm, so sure. through, but, but um, Len Wood, the managing director of EMI, was unhappy that George Martin was having an affair, if in the old fashioned sense of the word, um, with his secretary and just decided that with a combination of all these things who would he choose to make this Beatles record and he said I'll give it to George Martin. Um, this is explosive. <laughs> it, 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 it's all quite unlikely and, and, and fairly ridiculous um, and bizarre but absolutely true um, and in a way since George Martin and Judy have been together so so long I mean they've been married nearly 50 years now and they have children and grandchildren. I'm not even sure if they have great grandchildren. So it's actually rather beautiful in a way that by, by that kind of quirk of fate, the Beatles ended up with a recording contract. But you're saying that Len Wood did this in part to please Ardmore and Beechwood, yes. but to spite George Martin. Yes, yeah, spite is probably the wrong word, but, but just to, um, to give him the chore, if you like. Okay. And George Martin, the, the paperwork is absolutely clear. He the, the contract, he thought they were called the Beatles with two T's. That's how the contract was issued. Um, and it was not only issued up to Liverpool for Brian Epstein to sign, it was received back in London and processed uh, before the Beatles even set foot in EMI. So we really have, you know, Ardmore and Beachwood to thank. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And, and yeah. ultimately, they were sidelined after the first record. If you read the books, hmm. um, you will get the firm impression that Ardmore and Beechwood were useless and did nothing whatever to work Love Me Do. And George Martin then said to Brian, you should go to a publisher who's going to work a bit harder for you. But the irony of that is that Kim Bennett, who had started all of this, was the plugger for Love Me Do, and he worked incredibly hard to get it played. He even went to Germany to get a play, one single play, on BBC Radio back in Britain. Hmm. 
Um, and if that sounds strange, well, the, uh, the explanation for that is in the book. I won't go into it here. But he worked incredibly hard. But but they had been part of the process that caused George Martin to find the Beatles. I should stress, the moment George Martin met the Beatles, he knew they were different and special and he wanted to work with them. But things did not fall properly into place until Ardmore and Beechwood had been kind of sidelined out of the picture. And the story just got rewritten from that point onwards. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. And kind of like what we said earlier, there's a lot of twists and turns in the Beatles story of certain things didn't happen a certain way. It just so happens that around the time of uh, early 1962 or late 61, that was around the time when the Beatles were starting to play their new original songs. Mm -hmm. And that's a good reason why when they went in and did the deck audition recordings, they did three originals. And if they hadn't done Like Dreamers Do, <laughs> we may not be talking about them right now. And nobody would ever connect that song with the Beatles' history and what led to a record contract. And then, on top of all of that, the ironic thing is that when they did their first session on June 6th, they never recorded Like Dreamers Do. I know. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. And Like Dreamers Do has never been one of those songs that popped out at you as being fantastic i mean it because it, it it really was it wasn't i didn't think it was that great um i think I it's good i think it's a good song i don't think it's a great song yeah it's not it's not it's not the worst song they ever did i mean it's not as bad as like one and one is two <laughs> or uh you know um if you got troubles it's not that bad but yeah it's not a great song but but, you know, just listening to this story, how so much has changed, mm -hmm. just from knowing that. I mean, one of the things through the years when I've been doing my radio programs, and I've come to appreciate what the Beatles did as a band and that catalog so much more as years go on, and what the players around them did in the Beatles story and how much George Martin has contributed. And over the years, I have said repeatedly that everybody talks about, you know, his production work, but people forget that, George Martin signed the Beatles. Well, that's not the way it turned out. Yep. George Martin was not impressed with the Beatles based on the single that Brian Epstein played for him, mm -hmm. Hello, Little Girl, Until There Was You. Right. He wasn't that impressed with them on June 6th, you know, and it just so happened. It, Mark said to me that everything really started when George Martin heard Please Please Me because he was really impressed with that song. And yeah. in fact... He, it was George Martin who said, you need to record an album. And he did that before they even recorded Please Please Me. Right. So there's no doubt about it. George Martin deserves a ton of credit. It's hard to imagine at all what Beatle Records would have sounded like without his contribution, without his production work, without his suggestions for so many arrangements. But all these years that I've been led to believe that George Martin signed him, he was really, uh, you know, a as Mark explained, he was kind of strong-armed into signing them but and that's another but that's another logic or kind of a, a logic question is it that surprising that he didn't have the didn't he make the decision he was he was just a producer he you know uh, i mean he had he had bosses at emi right but all this time you know it's just it's been ingrained in my mind mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it's, Based it's on another everything, one of those, it's another one of those fairy. I, I don't want to say. I guess fairy tales is not the best word, but these fantasy stories that have gone around, you know, about the Beatles from various, you know, authors, and inter, you know, I guess you could probably trace it back to Hunter Davies because that's where a lot of this stuff started. But you know, it's just there's just so many interpretations and and. And even you know, you even have to kind of kind of put a hand on on Lewison too, because Lewison's book is not authorized, and he's very open about that, and mm -hmm. very you know, he's very honest that it's not an authorized book. Although he did have some contact with McCartney during the you know during the writing of the book, and and uh, and he's interviewed three three tons of people, but. You know, I've already, there's already been, I've already seen a comment, I'm not going to mention the person, 
but somebody who was very instrumental in the Beatles' history has been has complained already hmm. about about uh, about Mark's book uh, because apparently he didn't get interviewed. And you know, anytime anytime a history of the Beatles comes up, there's you know, there's going to be somebody not happy with you know, with what they've done, or are going to say, I mean, even Paul on on the new album has said, you know, the only people that know the story is, is us. Right. And so, you know, there's always interpretations. There's, there's different interpretations of, of their story by well, anyone who, who gets a hold of it. It's a tough decision to make. Mm-hmm. It is. What to believe. Do you only believe the story of the Beatles as the Beatles have told us? Because, as Mark explained to me when I interviewed him a few a few months ago, there were other people around them that observed a lot. Right, and the there Beatles, are other people who also took more credit than they should have, which Mark weeded out a few of those people from mm-hmm. his book. Um, yeah, and I talked to him about that. I talked to him about it months ago, mm-hmm. that there are people who want to elevate their status. And then he came back to me and said, there's also people who want to deflate their status. Right. They don't think they were that important. Right, we... I talked to him the same about the same thing in San Francisco, and so yeah, I mean, there's all that situation, and the funny thing is that if you get the the author's cut, a lot of that stuff that's not, you know, there's a lot more information in the author's cut. Right. And it, and it, it was interesting. He posted a big long, I don't know if you saw this. He posted a big long note about it yesterday on his Facebook page. And I'm, I have the text in front of me. And he said, if you have the mass market edition, in other words, the version that just came out, you have the complete story. What you get from the author's cut is you get more coverage of everything. He says more layers, more depth, more context, more anecdotes, more Beatles. Mm-hmm. So there's the difference. And, and I think there was a lot of people who were wondering what the difference between the two was. Well, there it is. Right. There it is. You know, concerning this story about the Beatles getting their record deal, mm-hmm. and this always happens any time I interview anybody. <laughs> At the end of the interview, I always say to myself, I wish I asked this. But what struck me is, it's very possible that the Beatles themselves never knew this whole backstory. I believe that. I'm not not totally surprised. I mean, there's one incident in the book where he talks about them getting their picture taken in a you know, in a, in a part of Liverpool that had connections to J- to John, and he said, "John, there's no way John could have known." And so, yeah, I'm sure there are all sorts of things that have happened. And there's going to be, as time goes on, this probably will not be the last book on the Beatles. I would be very surprised. Oh, come on! There'll be many more. <laughs> many, be many, many more. more. There'll be many more after we are long, long gone. And there will be revelations that will come out years ahead, you know, decades ahead. So, but, I mean, there's, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine anybody coming close to doing what Mark has done. Hmm. He's done an incredible job. The only person I can think of that's even close, and it's not even in the same category, is Spicer. Bruce Spicer's book books um, are just so in-depth and so detailed about, you know, about their, their subject matter. But he's, he's actually in a different area. He's not, you know, he's talking about the works of the labels. This is, he, Mark is talking about the Beatles stories. Yeah. Just one more thing about this very same issue. Mm-hmm. I wonder how much George Martin knew. For all we know, he could have just been told, you got to sign these guys, and that's it. Yeah, that's not. I don't think Mark really, really talks too much about that. And, and again, because a lot of the stuff is, is uh, you know, there's not uh, a lot of contact. Well, I mean, he did contact George Martin, but I'm sure there are secrets that, you know, that are still out there. There has to be, you know. Hmm. But he's done. But Mark, you have to. But Mark has done an incredible job. And uh, in case. People did not see what I wrote yesterday. It's uh, number 25 on the New York Times bestseller list. I hope it gets the number one. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm anxious to see where it's going to go. 
We have to wrap things up, but we spent a lot of time on two major issues. Let's just pick one more. And you want, tell to, pick me. One, you want to pick one more? I, I'll tell you the one that, that uh, the, uh, the incident that, that uh, surprised me was the, um, they did not see the uh, getting into the suits as selling out. That he, he um, undoes that long shared story. And, and George said, you know, they saw it as playing the game. They they knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. They knew it was part. It was a mark. It was a all. You know what we'd call it today, marketing. They knew. They knew that. They were smart enough to see that. And that was. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, they were really ambitious guys. They were. And people forget that. They weren't, and they weren't. They weren't dummies. You know, if you say uh, that, um, they. Uh, took on the suits on order of Brian Epstein and makes them look um, a little less, you know, like they knew what was going on. And they, they knew. They knew. So mm-hmm. that's, I, I think, I thought that was pretty interesting. What, yeah. what were you going to pull out? Well, something that, um, that Mark discussed and teased us with in my, my interview a few months ago, the fact that towards the end of 1961, the Beatles were on the verge of breaking up. Mm-hmm. Which... Um, is really not that hard to understand once you read this book because the Beatles had really gone as far as they could go at that point. They managed to become the most in demand, the number one band in Liverpool in 1961. And they had gotten constant gigs. They were always working. They could demand top dollar. They got paid more money than, than any of the other bands. And, of course, you got to give some credit to Mona Best, you know, for arranging the gigs that they got. I don't know if she was responsible for all of them, but the Beatles were paid more than anybody else to the point where they were actually bored. And and they could command more money than anybody else. The promoters or the owners of clubs would pay them what they wanted, and they would even not respect those people right. <laughs> because they can get away with it. And towards the end of 61, when John and Paul went to Paris, what they had actually done then they canceled two weeks of gigs <laughs> mm-hmm. that were already lined up for them. I mean, they didn't even care. <laughs> right. You know, the, the Beatles were really very restless people. They had to see progress being made. And if Brian Epstein hadn't come along at that time, who's to say what would have happened? He came along right at, at the very moment when they needed him most. So, you know, the Beatles... I remember Mark telling me this the first time I interviewed him when the Beatles Live came out back in the 80s. He said the Beatles are very difficult people. Mm -hmm. You read this book and you learn that. Yeah. (laughs) They're very stubborn, very committed to playing music. From the moment that they heard rock and roll, they knew this is what they wanted to do. And they were stubborn about getting their ways. And in the very beginning, you know, you got to do what other people tell you to do. But they, they stuck to their guns and did what they wanted. And they were not easy people to get along with. Yeah, well, yeah, that story has been has has been said many times, but, uh, but it's not surprising either, uh, because of the, given what they had to go through to to make it. Yeah, but at that point, late 1961, where were they going to go? They had to go beyond Liverpool. Somebody had to take them there, and that's exactly when Brian entered the picture. Mm-hmm. So you got to be very grateful that that happened when it happened. But right. Bob Wooler, who was the, the DJ at the Cavern, said these very words, that they really needed direction at that time. I mean, what kind of band, they already have gigs lined up for two weeks, would, would piss off <laughs> the promoters and the owners of clubs and cancel them? They burned a lot of bridges right. at that time. And Brian had a tough job to repair all the damage that the Beatles were doing. You know, right. it's amazing to think what they got away with, you know? So I really feel like you're living with them as this book, as, as, uh, you know, each chapter unfolds. You know what's going on in the lives of each of them, not just John, Paul, George, and Ringo, but Pete Best and Stu Sutcliffe and all the other major players, Alan Williams, for example, Sam Leach, the promoters, you know, and the people in Hamburg, Mm -hmm. Bruno Koshmeyer and all that, Tony Sheridan. You know what's going on, and you also know what's going on. You know, it, it's really fascinating the way that he's able to piece together almost 
week by week or month by month what's going on in, in each of their lives and threading it all together. And you, you really feel like you're living and breathing their lives. And I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this book. Right. And, um, you know, I highly recommend it to anybody. And it just takes you up to the end of 1962. So the next book, which I'm sure will take you from 63 to the middle period somewhere, that's probably going to be several years before that comes out. Yeah, it, it, he, he mentioned that in the, uh, in the statement he put out yesterday. He said he doesn't know where the second book will end. I'm guessing... My guess would be 60, the end of 67. That would be my, that would be a natural cutoff, I would think. Hmm. But that's just my guess. All right, but, so we, we highly recommend this book. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. There's really, I mean, uh, it's hard to argue against, I mean, I can't see anybody arguing against this. It's just, there's just so much detail, so much depth, so much information that has not been anywhere else. And the phenomenal amount of work that Mark did in this is just absolutely amazing. There's nothing else you can say. It's really like you're you're learning Beatle history all over again. Yeah, it's it it really is because there's so many. Uh, he's stripped away a lot of the the veneer. There's so many myths broken. There's so many people he talked to. It's it's just astounding. It's it, it really is. It really, really is. It's, it's. I'm, you know, I, I just hope I get to see the. We, I hope we all get to see the rest of this soon, because mm-hmm. that's going to be really disappointing if we don't. But. Well, we, I know we Mark. See, we Mark is see. looking forward to working on the next book right now. He's yeah, he's eager he's, to he's, to dive right in. So. Right, and that's what he does. What he says actually in the statement that, he says he's moving on to research and write volume two. Okay. So, but if he can. See. By all means, pick up this book and start reading. Yep. And you won't regret it. You won't. So if any of you would like to get in touch with us, please do so by writing to our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We read all of our emails here, and we might just answer some of them on the show. One of these days. So let me mention one more thing. <laughs> uh, the, the big question has been asked if the, extended, uh, if the uh, author's cut is coming out in America. He told me... He told me there's been no definite decision, and in the statement he issued yesterday, he said the answer is still unclear. He said it's up to the U.S. publisher to decide, which is Crown Archetype. Uh, and he suggested if you want to write to them, write to them and tell them to, you know, that you want to see it. But otherwise, the only way you can get it uh, right now is to get it from Amazon UK mm-hmm. or get it through the, the UK. So... There you go. And by the way, if any of you would like to hear more of my interview with Mark Lewis, then you can just go to my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Look up the page that says More Interviews, and you'll be able to hear pretty much the whole thing, almost an hour of conversation that I had with Mark. And uh, it's always a joy to talk to him. He's just one fascinating person with a wealth of knowledge. So that puts a wrap on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. For Things We Said Today, thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks for listening and look forward to talking to you next time.